Deborah Spencer from Marathon Training Academy. He's in Pennsylvania, USA. We're going international. Uh, Trevor, Trevor is the manager and producer of the MTA podcast. He has run 17 marathons, 50K, 21 half marathons, and a Spartan trifecta. In addition to running, he loves German beer, travel, books, self-employment, sleeping late, don't all of us, and making Angie, his wife and co-host, roll her eyes. So Trevor, what made you come onto a show with two, two girls who also roll their eyes? <laughs> I guess I'm in good company then. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for having me. Oh, Trevor, Thank welcome. You. Very, very welcome. So Trevor, can you tell us a story of how and why you started MTA? I think the idea uh, came with this, this question of does a marathon change a person's life? Is it a life changing experience? So my wife ran her first marathon in 2008 and I saw how dedicated she was in training all those early morning runs, those long runs, how intentional she had to be about um, fitting in her meals. And I asked her after it was all done and plus the agony of running 26.2 miles, 42 kilometers through, uh, you know, I think it took her four hours and maybe 10 minutes that first marathon. So she did pretty well for her first marathon. Yes. Mm. But I saw how she was limping back to the car after the race and was too sore to uh, move much the next day. So I asked her if she thought uh, running a marathon and training for a marathon was a life-changing experience. And she said, yes, I definitely believe that. Mm. So she went on and did more marathons, got better at it, dug into the science more, she has a nursing background, so already had a science background, but really uh, dug deeper into the science of endurance running. And uh, one day I approached her and I said, hey, I think you could help a lot of people. Let's start a podcast. This is in 2009. And she said, what's a podcast? So <laughs> <laughs> she was kind of low tech. So I talked her into starting a podcast about marathon training. And she said, well, you, you are going to have to start running more seriously because at that point I was just kind of dabbling in running. I would run maybe a mile at the most. I hated it. So I said, okay, um, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And that was uh, 10 years ago. Wow. That's amazing. But I think, Liesl, both you and I can attest to that, that a marathon does change your whole yes. perspective. It changes your mindset. It changes what you believe about yourself, about life, about business. Um, so that is why marathons or running is such a powerful narrative for me for life. Mm. Yeah, definitely. It is a great metaphor for life. So, yeah. In so many different levels, you can extract principles about marathon training um, and apply it to life, you know, about pacing yourself. You don't want to, you know, go out too fast and begin even marathon. And same thing in, in life or in business, every day is about balance and about pacing yourself and avoiding burnout emotionally, spiritually, physically, um, just in many ways. And I actually have a whole talk that I I've given about how life is a marathon. And if life is a marathon, here are the rules. Mm -hmm. And I usually yeah. give a talk to non runners who, who've never done a marathon. And so I kind of half poke fun of the running culture and talk about bloody nipples and runners trots and <laughs> strange things that get a lot of laughs. But then we, uh, we also talk about a lot of mindset stuff because yes. a lot of this is mental. You know, a lot of the endurance, uh, good endurance running is just comes down to mental training. It really is. And I think that is one of the things, um, we have seen now through this whole lockdown um, episode and the COVID pandemic, I don't know if you guys have been in lockdown. We've been in hard lockdown for five weeks where we were not allowed to go outside of your house. Then it was another extended period of literally a three hour window where we could train. And we still in lockdown. Um, so all of the races have been canceled. And um, I see a lot of runners actually struggling to adjust to the new rhythms of, of that. But on the other hand, the running community has been so creative. And that's actually what I love is the virtual races, new initiatives, and people just trying, knowing that running is 
such a great coping strategy for life, trying to integrate in one of the most difficult seasons of life. Exactly. Yeah, and a lot of people who we know has started to run in this season where they actually needed that outlet, that stress, you know, the stress relief in this time, um, and has started running, which, which I quite like. Um, Trevor, has the races returned in, in your, your part of the woods? Smaller races have. Um, I, I noticed that um, a 50K race in Montana that I did last year is actually happening, I think it's happening this following weekend, oh, but it's okay. only, you know, maybe 20 or 30 people that mm. come out for that. So I'm sure there's a lot of small races around the country that are continuing. There are some big races that are still not canceled uh, at the time of this recording, like Chicago Marathon, the mm. Marine Corps Marathon in Washington, D.C., which my wife has signed up for. Mm. But other big races like Boston and New York uh, have mm. been canceled. Yes. Trevor, you guys have um, a podcast that is extremely successful where you've got over 100,000 um, downloads around the globe um, per month. And it is also an iTunes essential running podcast. What is the secret to your success of your podcast? Well, I think the secret, I don't know if there's a secret. I think what's made us successful is um, we just help people believe in themselves mm -hmm. and there's something really empowering about that. And mm -hmm. every episode, uh, from the very beginning, we had a tagline, which was, you have what it takes to run a marathon and change your life. And I say that at the end of every episode, because we do want people to believe that they have what it takes. And, uh, the marathon can seem like this daunting challenge and it is, but, um, we all start as beginners and some of us like myself, you know, I really hated to run in the beginning. So it was especially inconceivable to me that I would ever want to run a marathon, mm. but um, it starts with just seeing what's possible, seeing a future ver version of yourself that's fit and healthy and strong and able to endure something as hard as a marathon and then uh, living into that identity and, uh, that's what we try to be like super encouraging, supportive and positive on the show. And once we get people to believe that they have what it takes, then we just provide the knowledge and the, the tools for them to get there. So it's, in, oh, it's nice. inspiration and it's knowledge. And I think that's a great combination and a little bit of personality. I think um, with my wife and I both being host of the podcast, there's that dynamic, you know, male, mm. female mm. dynamic. She's an experienced runner. I, I'm, I'm more of a lazy runner and was a complete beginner. I think, I'm, in your, I think um, I'm not nearly as good as you are, but I would be in that more lazy kind of um, <laughs> struggling to get around all my runs at the moment. Right on. All right. High five to you then. <laughs> high five, Trevor. Yes. yes. Yeah, I the think that's, a, that's the thing. Our tag tagline is uh, you can go any distance one step at a time which ties into what you just said, is that um, the marathon seems like a daunting task, but if you break it down, and that's almost like any distance, if you break it down into smaller chunks, it's, it's not that daunting anymore. Um, and I think anyone can go any distance. You have interviewed hundreds of people um, over time, lots of them being very well known in the running community. Is there any particular interview that stood out for you? And if so, why? Yes, lots of great uh, guests that we've been ha had the privilege of having on the show. Uh, very interesting people. And I do get asked this question quite a bit. And I usually give the same answer. Coincidentally, um, since you were in South Africa, uh, I, my, my number one guest that I always talk about is Tim Noakes. Oh, uh, Tim I, Noakes. I, I listened to the most, well, I don't, it's not most recent, but I don't know if it's about a year ago that you interviewed him. It was quite yeah, a, quite yeah, a, a couple of years ago. Yeah. So I had never heard of Tim Noakes, like most, uh, most people that are not runners, you know, you, he's kind of famous in the running world. Mm especially in the, in the running science world. But when Angie, my wife, started getting more interested in uh, 
coaching and really uh, digging into the science. I went, I was in Barnes and Noble uh, bookstore uh, when we were living in Missouri. And I, I went over to the section where they had books about running, which is a pretty short shelf, right? Not very many <laughs> books in, in the, in Barnes and Noble Always. and that, but um, one of the uh, employees saw I was looking for something and he came up and said, Hey, uh, can I help you find a book? And I said, I'm looking for a really you know, good book about all things marathon training. And he said, Oh, let me go get so-and-so he runs marathons all the time and he could tell you which book you need to get. So I'm like, all right, cool. So this, this guy came up who worked there. He was really excited to meet another runner. <laughs> and he said, you've got to read the lore of running by Tim Noakes. Many well, that is like Bible. such a thick book. Yeah, it's not, it looks like the Bible. Let's yeah. Read. It's like 900 pages. So <laughs> I, 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 I bought the book, the book probably paid $40 for it, um, brought it back to Angie and she just devoured it. Um, she read the whole it. thing. Yes. Yeah. No, and, and many of his other books also, he's got, I think a 400 page book called waterlogged, which is all about yes. drinking water. I don't exaggerate yeah. just a whole book, 400 pages about how to drink water. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's, it's more than that, but it's about hydration uh, during the run in the long run. So anyway, we had Tim Noakes on the podcast a couple times, and he's so gracious and almost has like this grandfatherly manner. Uh, you know, he's quite a bit older mm. than we are now, but mm. just so gracious. And um, I'm sure everyone is like that in South Africa. Just, just really. Uh, <laughs> Every single nice person. And... Friendly. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> but. The, he always has such great content and just mind exploding ideas. If, so if anyone listening to this, uh, get a chance to check out what he says about the central governor theory of fatigue in the body, mm -hmm. basically how that fatigue is more a mental emotion, a uh, mental sensation and mm -hmm. an emotion than it is an actual physiological uh, occurrence in your muscles mm -hmm. and your mind gives out before your body gives out in a mm -hmm. race. Yeah, so he says that, uh, that the reason that you can run the last mile of a marathon even harder than maybe five miles before that, that's just uh, proof that it's not your body giving out, it's your, it's your mind giving out. Exactly. Yeah. The finisher's kick. Yes. Yeah. The gist of it is, is that our brains try to keep us in balance and mm -hmm. keep us from hurting ourselves and maybe overheating or getting too tired because our default setting in our, our brains, our central governor is to preserve resources, preserve energy. So it'll, it'll make you feel like you're more, your brain will make your, make yourself think that you're more tired than you actually really are just so the, to slow you down to preserve resources. And the truth is you can push harder. You can mm. push further then you might feel like you can. And like you said, Liesl, it's the, the finisher's kick, the fact that mm. you can actually sprint at the end. Mm. And you're like, whoa, what did that extra reserve of energy come from? Mm. Your brain was hiding it from you, he says. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty that's awesome. Stuff. That's actually such a powerful um, thing to explore and actually look into the whole psychology of running as well. Um, oh, yes. And I think that's where a lot of people sometimes struggle is um, I can't do it. And, and just by rewiring and thinking again about what is the thoughts that I allow and actually getting underneath that limiting beliefs around um, my capability and running, um, I think we can actually go a lot further than what we believe. Mm. And I, I, think, I think my brain is working very well when I run because I'm trying to lose weight, but it's preserving all of my energy. <laughs> <laughs> in the lower parts of my body. Oh, yes, it's, it's insidious how that happens. <laughs> Trevor, you have a self-confessed rebel personality type. Um, according to Gretchen Rubin that I, that I also heard on your podcast. Um, and you don't like the rigid, rigidness of training. But despite this, you've run 17 marathons. Um, so what, what keeps you coming back to the marathon training, even though you you're not a big fan of the, of the training. Yeah. Um, Gretchen Rubin has this brilliant book 
uh, called Better Than Before. It's about habits, how to establish successful habits, because we all want to just be able to do things automatically without any resistance or using our willpower, like just boom, go exercise or sit down to Mm. work and just make it automatic, healthy habits. Mm. And there's lots of books written about that, like Charles Duhigg, The The Power of Habit. He talks about having triggers in your environment Mm -hmm. and so forth. But she says, um, all of those tools are correct, but they, the effectiveness of those tools, those habit creation tools depends on your tendency. Some people are, they tend to be rebels like myself. And I just don't like that. Uh, I don't like structure or to have my, my um, schedule, my daily schedule, you know, planned out. Cause I'm more like to be flexible and sort of free form mm. or my wife is the opposite. She likes to have everything planned on a calendar. And if her calendar says run five miles, It gives her great satisfaction to check that off and to do five miles. So she would be, in Gretchen Rubin's parlance, um, an upholder. She likes to uphold uh, the expectations that she sets for herself. Mm -hmm. Whereas I rebel against expectations, outward expectations, and sometimes my own inner expectations. So it's a great framework from Gretchen Rubin. And you you asked me, how how am I able to run marathons even though I – don't train like an upholder, uh, even though I've, I don't like sticking to a schedule. Um, I think that it's a great question because there's probably other people that identify with not mm. being able to stick faithfully to a training plan. Maybe they have a rebel personality. If they don't feel like going out and run running today, they won't, they'll just do it tomorrow. So I think what keeps me going is identity. Um, I have to be motivated to uh, become the type of person I want to be in the future. So mm-hmm. I want to be the kind of person that runs marathons and mm-hmm. travels the world running in beautiful places. Therefore, since I want to be that person, that identity that I've accepted for myself, then I'll go out and train and make that future possible. Mm-hmm. So it goes back to my love of travel, uh, a sense of freedom, because I, I want to be free to be able to run up a mountain if I want to Mm -hmm. or hike the grand Canyon or the Appalachian trail or other huge uh, challenge. If I want to, I want that freedom. Therefore I need to have the fitness. So for me, it has to go back to identity. I don't get, I don't get pleasure just from crossing things off a checklist. doesn't do it for me. Um, One of my values is freedom. And so running marathons is a way for me to, just get out there and run free and experience mm. the world. And it's sort of like my form of rebellion. Mm. I love I that. that that's a, yes, that makes total sense. hundred percent because that's, that's what I'm like as well. I okay. do not always love the training. I, it's hard for me sometimes to get out the door, especially like you say, if, if I've got the, the training schedule and all the things and, and I've got five training, uh, training blocks for the week. Um, it's, it doesn't give me satisfaction to tick it off, but I want to be a marathon and an ultra marathon runner. And because of that, mm-hmm. I need to run marathons and ultra marathons. And my husband exactly. was asking me the other day, why are you going for long runs now? It's locked down. There's no races. And I said the exact same thing to him. I want to be a marathon runner. So I need to run long distance. I, I want to be a long distance runner. Um, so that is exactly what it is, what it's like for me as well. Yeah. If, if you're a rebel, then lockdown, that that's even makes it worse. Right. Cause like, screw this screw lockdown. I'm going out to run. Definitely. <laughs> uh, we had a, we had a locked the hard lockdown in level five where we uh, couldn't run outside of our properties. And I used to make all of these plans, how I was going to run outside of my property at, in, at night, nine o'clock at night, I would go out. <laughs> When you were not allowed to be seen outside. Exactly. Wow. They, oh, cannot, they can't lock me down. <laughs> it's like, they you might come catch and me fetch first. you. <laughs> yeah. exactly. but, but Trevor, your wife has done um, something amazing where she did literally 50 mar- marathons in the 50 different states recently. Um, has that inspired you in any way for a new big running goal? Yeah. She, uh, she just finished that goal in January before, um, the virus really hit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were in Hawaii. She did her last 
race in Hawaii. So save the best for last. And she actually ran faster her last marathon than she did any of the previous ones, even though she's older now, mm. 41. So she ran 319. Oh, and <laughs> it's amazing. I know. Yeah, she ran uh, like almost an hour faster than her first her first marathon, oh, really? even though she's 10 years older. So it, it's, it's, I just make that aside just to say that it's cool that in our sport, you can get better even though you get older. And that's, it's not like that in some other sports. Mm-hmm. But yes, uh, she, she has been a big source of inspiration. I don't have a goal, a massive running goal that I've committed to. I have some ideas. Maybe it's because I'm a rebel. I just hate to commit because I might change my mind, but I have a dream wow. of, of running. I do have a dream of running a marathon in every country in Europe. Awesome. I think there's what about 40. South Africa? For sure. But you guys, you first got to move South Africa to Europe. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> actually, Angie and I, both, uh, both of us have on our bucket list to run the Comrades Marathon mm-hmm. in South Africa. I don't know if I'm ready to go 50 miles yet. It's and, quite a uh, way. I want to. I want to do it on a downhill year when you when you get to run the course down. Apparently, yep. that is a lot worse than the uphill because it's mm-hmm. insane on your quads. Yeah, the, the furthest I have run is fifty k. Yeah. So, yeah, going up to ninety. What is what is the official distance of the comrades in it's, kilometers? Um, it was 89. last year. I think it was. Yeah, it's eighty nine. Eighty nine. Yeah. Yeah, that I would definitely um, see that would be a good challenge because that would kind of force myself to build up my my mileage base to that mm. much. But mm. yeah, I have wanted to come to South Africa for years. I think I first heard about the Comrades Marathon, reading about it in Bart Yasso's book, My Life on the Run. And then we had him on the podcast. He was one of our first early guests. And for those that don't know, um, he was the chief running officer at runner's world magazine and they would just pay him to go around the world run races and report and talk about it in the magazine so everyone knows him in in the states at least he's just really cool guy and he he said that of all the thousands of races that he's been to no no race is as special just the feeling in the air just how special as the comrades marathon he said there's Mm -hmm. nothing like it Mm -hmm. so i first heard about it from him and we wanted to come and do it ever since. So you someday. will have to, you will have to let us know when you come. Um, we'll go as spectators and support no, you. No, no, no. Trevor, <laughs> Karina, and I will run it with you. There you go. That's what I want to hear. Don't make promises <laughs> on my behalf, please. <laughs> Just give me enough time. That's right. If I can do no. it, anybody can. No, I've wa- I've been wanting to run the comrades for a few years now. Um, so definitely, if you if you run it, Trevor, let me know, and I'll I'll come run it with you. And then we'll go get some wine afterwards, right? Oh yes, and some craft and beer. <laughs> we'll do that. We'll Perfect. have to introduce you to that. Like us at Run Life Repeat, you guys have a heart for helping runners realize their potential and achieve big running goals. Your motto is you have what it takes to run a marathon and change your life. What advice do you have for some of our listeners who may be newbie runners and think they would never be able to do a 5K, let alone a a marathon? I like that question because that was me. Uh, I felt that way. I've been doing this for 10 years now, but um, in the beginning, I remember training for my first 5K and I, it was hard to run even one mile. So what I started doing was uh, building up to one minute that was even uncomfortable. So I would run a minute and then I would walk for one minute, run for one minute, walk for one minute until I got comfortable doing that. I was so out of shape, but I got comfortable doing that. And then I uh, expanded to three minutes of running, one minute of walking. So then I was doing three at a time. And then uh, I think I built up to running a whole mile without stopping. So it's just baby steps, you know, and uh, a lot of times when you're, a new, when you're new to this, you think you have to go out there and run fast and hard, or you're not doing it right. Mm -hmm. Like you have to be sweating and heaving. And that's a common misconception. Um, It's okay to just 
take walk breaks. It's okay to go slow. Uh, you, you don't have to give maximum effort every single run. Uh, you can actually burn fat. I think the research has shown at a lower maximal effort, a lower heart rate zone, uh, get in that fat burning zone they talk about. So there's, I think just getting over sort of the mental hurdles of maybe people are worried that they don't look like a runner or they're not a real runner and they're just embarrassed to get out there. But if you go to a race, like if you sign up for a 5k and just commit and go to a 5k, you'll see all kinds of people, all different body types, shapes and sizes of people and they're out there doing it. And so if you run, you're a runner, just embrace it and don't worry about what people think. You're not going to be the most out of shape person at the race. I'm almost positive and you probably won't finish last. And even if you do finish last, as long as you finish, that's what matters. Trevor, I, I finished last that. in the race. <laughs> <laughs> I have actually that finished last. Last. <laughs> That's what they call uh, D C D F N no DFL. No, no. Dead what happened last. was <laughs> What happened was it was a trail race and there, there was like 10 people and those 10 people were fast. I mean, really fast. We, okay. The well, race started well, and I count. never saw them again. So I just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, but that's other good. than that, yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. You'll never be lost in the race. Just don't go do yeah, the trail races where there's only 10 people. Exactly. Yeah. I wasn't <laughs> thinking of that. <laughs> <laughs> was exceptional little um, and you've got a story to tell um, Trevor um, just on a personal note how has your life changed or how has running uh, to some significant changes for you personally well it definitely put me in a more healthy place uh, physically mm -hmm. I was kind of a desk potato and not that active before I started running I just spend a lot of time behind a computer screen. And as you get older, you start losing muscle mass and uh, start adding fat more easily. So running really helped me stay healthy and has helped me stay healthy. And also I think the, the mental toughness that long distance running especially gives you to be able to, to, be able to push through hard things and uncomfortable things on purpose, like to go, to go choose to suffer intentionally mm. uh, because no, no, nobody has to do this. We don't have to go run marathons. No one, no one makes us do it. We choose that pain and choosing pain like that and getting over those obstacles, I think helps a person professionally. Uh, it helps a person on so many different levels. Mm. There's a, a guest we've had on the podcast a couple of times, Joe DeSena. He is the founder of the Spartan Race. Uh, obstacle race series and uh, it's pretty popular over here in the u.s and people uh will run five five to ten miles and they'll have to like do all these obstacles go through pits of mud and climb walls and stuff and he talks about this concept of obstacle immunity where if you are out there on purpose uh making yourself do hard things like swim through cold water mm -hmm. climb walls carry buckets of rocks you're overcoming these obstacles, then it becomes easier and easier just to do harder, harder and harder things. Mm -hmm. You build up an immunity to obstacles. Mm -hmm. So many people quit uh, at the, just the slightest thing. You know, they see mm -hmm. some steps like, oh, I can't go up there and just too many steps. Like what if that wasn't an obstacle to you at all? Mm -hmm. I just recently uh, was surfing the internet and I stumbled upon a, uh, a little island called uh, St. Helena in the, I think it's the Atlantic, kind of off the coast of Morocco. It's a British territory, but in St. Helena Island, there's uh, something called Jacob's Ladder, which is a staircase that goes from the harbor, like way up this mountain. And it's just a steep, brutal staircase. And you have to hold on to rails. Uh, otherwise, you'll topple backwards. So immediately, I saw that Jacob's Ladder. It's kind of a famous landmark uh, in the, on the island. And I thought, I want to do that. That looks so fun to climb Jacob's ladder and to, and to get to the top of the mountain and look over the whole island. So to, to be able to look at something like that, which is an obstacle and think, no big deal. You know, I just want to do it. That's obstacle immunity. Mm -hmm. And I, I think running keeps me 
in shape enough to be able to do stuff like that, which is, the, mm. I think, the best way to live life. Mm. I absolutely love this concept of obstacle immunity. We're going to work with that, Trevor, because yeah. I think um, that is um, we. Uh, I think that is actually also that resiliency that we build to um, bounce back after, um, not actually bounce back, to bounce forward. Um, through challenges and through difficulties and say, you know what, um, we can learn from this. What can we learn from that? How can we approach it differently? And that is actually what inspires other people because it's a completely different mindset. It's completely different to the norm that is out there. It's literally like 2% of your population that will have that kind of mindset. Mm. There's a motivational speaker. I, I can't remember his name now. Maybe you guys would know. He is famous for, well, he's famous for a lot of things, but he takes a cold shower every day to force himself to do hard things to build um, that strategy that you were just talking about. My wife is Tom actually Billio. doing that. Tom Bilio. Tom Bilio, yeah. Is it yeah. him? Yeah, he's the founder of, uh, he's the founder of Quest, Quest Nutrition, mm -hmm. and he's got okay. a podcast, uh, I forget what it is, Impact Theory, I think it's called. Impact Theory, yes. So, my wife has been reading this book about, um, about doing hard things. I forget the exact title, but uh, it's about cold training. And they talk about Wim Hof from, mm. uh, you know, the Scandinavian, I think he's maybe a Swede, who, uh, who can just sit out in the ice naked for, oh, for hours. Lord. Yeah, have you heard of him? Wim Hof. <laughs> and we got to Google amazing. him afterwards. <laughs> you should. He's, he's, pretty, he's pretty big, big deal in, in this whole endurance mm. space but um she's started taking cold showers and she's up to like five minutes at oh, a time that's that's a long time i know i hate cold water has but it that's been obstacle working for immunity. her though has it been working for her yeah yeah mm. i mean she's pretty zen already like she her her mind is a well well oiled machine mm. of doing tough things I mean, just for the hell of it, the other day, she ran a 50K on the treadmill doing a 5K at a time for 10 hours. Wow. So 5K every, every hour for 10 hours, just, just for fun. Didn't tell anybody, just did it, just to see if she could do it. That doesn't during sound lockdown. amazing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, that, is, that is amazing. Right. So, yeah, I mean, if, if those that are listening to this right now, if, if they can just purposely make themselves do hard things, you know, if you see – Take the stairs instead of the elevator. Uh, go out and run when it's hot. You know, be safe. Take water, but or, or when it's raining, like you know, we all know we should be exercising. Uh, mm -hmm. That's probably not. No one's arguing against that. But then we go outside and it's raining and we don't run because mm -hmm. oh, well, I might get wet. Well, big mm -hmm. deal if you get wet. Mm -hmm. Like that's gonna stop you. Just push through it, and uh, then you'll probably have a great time and have fun, have something to tell a story about. I love the work of Brené Brown, and she does a lot of work around um, emotions and vulnerability and stuff like that. And she's got something that she normally says: is you cannot selectively numb because we avoid difficult emotion, difficult emotions as well. And as you were talking about doing the hard things in life. Um, I think there's a very similar concept as to you cannot selectively numb. You cannot be successful if you're not willing to go through pain and challenges. If you're not willing to do the hard stuff, you will never be successful. I think it's very much the same principle um, yeah. that we can apply to running and life and doing hard things as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, Bre Brene Brown. Uh, has so many great books. That's one of my, that's one of Angie's favorite authors, like Daring Greatly is, is oh, a great one. Brilliant. Uh, the, the, gift of, the Gifts of Imperfection was one of the ones that I really loved and studied as well. Um, especially her TED Talks um, really had a huge impact on me while I was doing my coaching studies. Um, hmm. It was just, I think the first time that as she was talking about vulnerability and shame and all these things, um, I just so resonated with what she was sharing. Um, and it helped me to process quite a lot of things um, in a very difficult time in my life as well. Mm -hmm. Travis, thank you so much for your time. It's been, it's been so great chatting to you. Um, 
and like I said, you you are a celebrity to us, so it's it's <laughs> it's been such an honor having you having you on our show. Um, yeah, and to, for you to to give us your time, thank you very much. Well, thank From you for us. having me. I know sometimes um, I, I don't feel like a celebrity, and if you if you meet a celebrity in real life, you're like, oh, that's kind of a letdown. So hopefully it wasn't. <laughs> from my side as well thank you so much thank you for your time i think this was um inspirational in more than one way and um, there's lots of nuggets that we can take from you um i'm going to go back and listen to more of your podcast because lizel was the one that's really been listening and following you guys i think i've missed out so i'm going to catch up now and um really get um into some of your stuff and there is so many things that you've shared with us that i think our listeners will be able to connect with and i believe that there is stuff that will inspire people to live remarkable lives that will continue to inspire other people and i think that is what um, it's all about and it was really really nice to meet you if you come out and do two oceans or come and do uh, comrades um let us know we'll be there cheering for you and angie <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> it's great to know that we have friends in South Africa and nice, nice to have a new listener. Thank you. And um, if anyone else wants to check out the podcast, um, just go to wherever you get your podcast and type in marathon training Academy uh, or just marathon training. will sometimes pull it up. Mm-hmm. You know, we're in iTunes. We're pretty big in iTunes, but did you know that, uh, well, you probably do. The I, iTunes in the U.S. looks different than in uh, South Africa or other countries. So the top shows in the U.S. might not necessarily be the top shows in iTunes South Africa. So I don't know oh, how well we know. rank. Yeah. Okay. So if you go to the U.S. iTunes, uh, we have like over 900 reviews, I think. But if oh. you go to the South Africa, I would be surprised if we only had like a handful or if any. I'm sure we will definitely go and review for you and um, All right. we'll I promote like you. We'll <laughs> tag your um, website and your um, Facebook page in our um, podcast that people can follow you because I think that is the other thing that is important to us is building a community of like-minded people across the globe. Right. Mm. Yeah. Right. Trevor, thank you so much. Thank you. Great speaking with you and, and uh, God bless and wishing you massive success uh, in your podcasting.